know, a game controller, if you're doing a task on here, when you're aiming, you're actually doing a pretty complicated thing. You're positioning your thumb at some finicky little distance, and then you're integrating over time. So your brain's doing this fairly complicated task, and it's amazing watching pro players, what they can do with all of that, but that is two steps removed. Now, I was huge on 60, the importance of 60 frames per second. That was my big triumph for Rage, that we stuck with that and we pushed that through, and it plays wonderfully. There is a difference between 30 and 60 frames per second, even with a controller. But I went and did these tests at 120 and 170 hertz on here, and on a game controller, I don't think there's really any difference. Now, with a mouse, that's only one step removed, because that's directly translating horizontal motion to angular motion. And most people that are, are real gamers can tell the difference on a 120 hertz update with a mouse on there. But still, you know, your average person that's just playing a casual game still won't. But, a, you know, a connoisseur will be, able to, will be able to tell the difference. Now, with a head tracking, head mounted display, it's zero steps removed. Your brain knows what it's supposed to look like when your head moves like this. It's, an, it's a very natural, instinctive thing, so it is much more latency intolerant than anything else. So you really want to minimize the latency. And I've got enough data to think that the magic number is somewhere around 20 milliseconds. If you're 20 milliseconds from the time something moves to the time photons come out of a display and hit your eye, your brain can buy that as seeing continuous reality. You still have to worry about strobing effects and some other things, but this is kind of a dilemma when you've got a 60 hertz update rate where it takes 16 milliseconds just to scan the whole screen out. You have no time left for doing anything else, and that needs to be addressed with more frames per second. And even there, there are things that the eye can see as high as 240 hertz or so, but you don't need to go that high. We go to 120 hertz, and then we do smart eye stochastic uh, motion blur on there, not just blending frames, but varying it on a per pixel level. That'll be good enough. So. That's one of the experimental paths that I've been pursuing is this very high update rate display. There's no reason Sony can't make that update at 120 hertz. It won't really cost them anything. So, but I, I need this example. I need this proof of concept to be able to, you know, club Sony about the head and say, no, here it is, look at this, this is better. You should do this, you should care. And I, that's one of the axes that I've been working on. It's neat by itself on there. Um, the other direction is massive field of view. So the Sony display, again, is pretty cool. It's my baseline. It's up to 45 degrees, which is borderline acceptable. It's starting to be interesting, but it's by no means the whole world. Uh, this display that I'm demoing on here, the Oculus Rift, is it actually has a 90 degree horizontal field of view and 110 degrees vertical, which means it's five times the visual angle packed into there that the Sony has. It occludes the entire world. All you see is the virtual world. And uh, that's axis number two. Axis number three is the absolute position tracking, where here I'm doing attitude tracking on here, and I do some modeling to get a little bit of a lever arm on it, but with the right sensors, you want to be able to like slide your head here, get down on the ground, move around on there. This demo, again, does not have that. It's fast, but it's not as fast as what it needs to be for reality. And while it accurately tracks orientation like that, if you sway your body, it doesn't track that translation. So that means the way to kind of give yourself simulator sickness in this, like if you look down at the floor and sway your body side to side, because it doesn't know you're moving, the whole world's kind of moving with you. And that's, you know, that's harmful. And then the resolution's not great. It's a single 1280 by 800 panel on there, split between the eyes. But you can see the individual pixels in the center of the field of view. But that's totally gonna be, we're gonna have 1080p panels any month now. and. Toshiba's got a two and a half K panel that would be perfect for this. And all that could be great. But so I was pursuing all this techie stuff sort of for my own interest on here. But when we decided to do the, the BFG edition on here for Doom 3, uh, the thought was, well, how do you get people interested or excited about an eight year old title? You know, it was a landmark title. It still looks great. You know, once you go below the top tier stuff, you can find a lot of stuff around here at E3 that doesn't look as good as our eight year old title. And, you know, I, I brought it up to 60 frames per second on the consoles. It's cool for that. I, we've got new levels. We up some of the textures. It's neat in all these ways, but it's an eight year old title. It's not this leading news item thing in any way. So I thought, you know, well, 
I've been doing all this stereoscopy and VR stuff. I, Microsoft and Sony both support HDMI 3D TVs now, and they're both you know, encouraging that to some degree. So I can do a good job on the 3D TV support on there, uh, make that something that, you know, there's millions of people that'll try that. I'm not a huge booster of 3D TVs. The super cool stuff is this custom homebrew stuff that we've been cooking up on here, these other axes of improvement. And, you know, this is worth uh, coming and taking a look at because it's great that you've had you've seen these things before because if you've never tried this, you put this on and people's like, oh, this is what people have been talking about virtual reality for 20 years. It's kind of what people always thought it was. But what we had wasn't what people thought it was, and this really is. So this is pretty cool, and I'm pretty excited about what we've got on here because I've been able to, to make some changes into the game directly to support this, where you can move your weapon independently of the view instead of having it locked to your view there. So you can use the stick to aim as well as turn on there. So being able to spend even just a few days making the game better in the experience rather than just saying, look, it's in 3D on here, that's been nice to have that. And it's, uh, let me go ahead and get you, get you set up on here to run through a little bit of it. I've actually masked off part of the optics here because this has a, it's a 16 by 10 screen on here split in half, so you don't have a symmetric field of view. Uh, you have 110 degrees vertically and 90 degrees horizontally, roughly, on this. If the tape wasn't there, you could see this curved edge of the screen, and it's out in the distance at okay. your focal point. Yeah, yeah. And on most displays, like if you're wearing the Sony, you see this yeah. nice rectangular area out there. It's your yeah. screen. Yeah. And that's, that's hard to convince yourself that you're in there. With this setup on here, you can either see the goggle or the virtual world. There's nothing else that you see down at the focal space on there. So this gives you, it covers everything. When you've got this on, you can't see anything but what's in here. Got the headphones on, it does block you off and immerse you in there. It's just a ski mask mount on there. <laughs> Better? Still too tight? Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Whoa. All right, the headphones. Whoa. Is. This is really impressive. This is crazy. Really cool. And so yeah, if you've if you've tried any other head mounted display yeah. before.